Welcome to the webcast Control System Fundamentals, Control Algorithms, specifically PID. My name is Peter Adelhart. I'm responsible for sales and marketing at Datahead. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. First, I would like to introduce us, Datahead, as a National Instruments Alliance partner. Then I'm going to go over the PID basics and the programming options. We're going to discuss some of the control design techniques and how to deploy PID algorithms to hardware. Then we'll see some applications and this will conclude the webcast. Datahead is a German Silver Level Alliance partner with the electronic design specialty. We're located in Nuremberg and we've deployed over 1,000 distributed RIO systems in monitoring and control applications. Now this is our product and solution portfolio. I'd like to point out two specific areas of expertise. The one is energy monitoring, both for power plants and for production sites, and the other is the testing of prototypes. One of our customers was looking for a way to test and monitor up to 50 heating system prototypes in the field at various customer sites. We developed a single bird Rio based logger and a cloud storage and visualization system for him and his R&D engineers to analyze and visualize the data. To learn more about this and other application examples, please go to datahead.de. I'm going to go more deeply into control applications and the PID. I'm going to start with the basics. Here we see a closed loop control system. So the set point is the desired control point, and the output is the controller output. The process variable is the output of your plant or the process, and the error is set point minus the process variable. When we talk about the PID, we talk about the world's most common algorithm for analog control, and it consists of three parts that are actually controllers by themselves. Well, one is proportional, and it means that the further the system is from the set point, the larger the actuator output to drive it to the set point. The integral part means that the longer the system has been off from the set point, the larger the actuator output to drive it to the set point. And derivative means that the faster the system is changing, the larger the actuator output to drive it to the set point. I want to point out the importance of tuning a controller. That means finding the gains for P, I, and D. Typically, this is being done by trial and error, but we will also talk about other ways of finding those values. There are many ways of programming PID controllers in LabVIEW. The most common would be to use the VIs that are shipped with the PID and Fuzzy Logic Control Toolkit. On real-time targets, you can also use function blocks. If you want to simulate your control design, LabVIEW Control Design and Simulation Toolkit offers you that option. For FPGA targets, there are specific FPGA VIs that leverage the highly parallel nature of FPGAs. And then, of course, there are other ways in the Control Design and Simulation Toolkit and in the Textual Math node that you can program a PID in. This is a closed loop control with a classic PID controller. To help you find the right gains for your controller, you can use auto tuning functions. When your system needs different parameters at different operating regions, you can use gain scheduling. Integral anti windup helps avoiding issues with the integral part of the controller when, sat when the controller is saturating over time. Adaptive control is a more advanced technique. It is self-tuning, and it means that a parameter or a structure of the controller modifies when the plant changes. In order to know that, the system needs to consider both the inputs and outputs of the plant. And this so-called plant estimator will in turn reconfigure the controller. Optimal control means that parameters of the controller are constantly being optimized for a specific operation. For optimal control, you need a model of the plant. The optimizer runs a cost algorithm that has a user-defined goal, such as the time to reach a stable output or the amount of energy that is being used. The output of the optimizer are the new gains for the PID controller. Traditional feedback controllers can only adjust control action in response to a change in the output set point of the plant. Using model predictive control, controllers can be designed that adjust the control action before the change in the output set point actually occurs. 
This predictive ability, when combined with traditional feedback operation, enables a controller to make adjustments that are smoother and closer to the optimal control action values. Regardless of the computational models that you chose to design your control application, you can easily deploy it to any NI platform. Usually for a control application, you would choose a real-time capable system such as NIPXI or NI Compact Rio, where you can also leverage the FPGA functionality. Here's an application example of a high-performance hydraulic control system. In this case, we were testing an automotive shift actuator similar to the one pictured in the center of the screen. And we were doing this by emulating gear force waveforms. On the right side of the screen, you see that we had to control the actuator. And in this case, we used a set point profile of displacement over time, controlling a prop valve that was part of the hydraulic system that controlled the actuator. On the left hand side, we had to exert an opposing force that emulated the force of the actual gear. This also was an independent controller implemented on the Compact Rear FPGA target. Since we had four of each, we had altogether eight independent PID controllers implemented. To summarize, PID is the most common control technique, and it can also be combined with advanced control techniques. There are many options available in the NI tool chain, and there's advanced platforms for high-speed control, such as the RT and FPGA targets. So thank you very much from us at Data Ahead and make sure to see all the other interesting webcasts of this series.